Uh, first, I want to say thank you all for coming. Um, the second thing I want to say is it's an honor to be here at Howard University again. I've been here a couple times when I was much younger. Uh, probably, yeah, about 25 years ago. Uh, I did a couple of projects here. I'm very happy to have worked with the folks here. And I also want to thank uh, uh, the AAAS for supporting this, this lecture and, and inviting me to, to come and present. Um, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I am uh, just getting back from Cuba, uh, researching a project on, uh, for the series Nova. And I actually had prepared remarks uh, which we're not going to speak to that project, but having been in uh, Cuba for about seven or eight days, five days of research and two days of filming, I'm still processing the entire experience. And so I'm going to try to introduce a little bit of that, which will help me stay focused. And it might be an interesting way to also to set up the remarks I have. Um, let me say a brief bit about the project, and then I want to sort of segue into, into, the, into the talk. Um, so I was there with my uh, producer partner, uh, Kelly Thompson, and the project, uh, I find it very fascinating. And, 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 and I'll try to describe it briefly. Um, we are looking at um, a Cuban vaccine that's developed by the biotech industry, um, which is being distributed around the world, which is made for uh, stage three and stage four lung cancer, and, is, and appears to be fairly effective. Um, the bio industry in Cuba was begun by Fidel Castro. It was a personal interest, interest, interest of his. And so what we want to look at is not just the idea of um, immunology, where it comes from, what it means, but and look at it through the development of this drug. So we we'll look at the overall science, but also there's another question I, which I think is, which I find very fascinating, which is how did a small country which has been embargoed by the United States for 55 years uh, developed not only this area of, of, of technology expertise, but also why it hasn't been part of our understanding generally of immunotherapy. So the two questions. Um, so we're talking to people um, connected with the various uh, technologies that we want to study, who've been very open, very welcoming. We are driving through. Uh, Havana, uh, taking pictures, doing some scouting. Um, and as you go through Havana, uh, if you've never been there, it's an amazing um, visual sort of montage of, uh, it's like, it's like Parisian architecture blended with uh, architecture from Madrid, blended with New Orleans architecture, and all that sort of marinated in, you know, in time, but also uh, economic trauma, um, also um, vibrant culture, just a very complex picture. Um, and there are also these posters sometimes and uh, public statements by the government. And we took note of those and we're taking note of the places we want to film and we come back and do our, real, our production work next year. And then there was one poster that really struck me, um, which I want to show you right now. Could you put that up for me, please? I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you, you, it, it's important to see. Even though it's in Spanish, it's important to see. Does anybody read Spanish? Who said yes? Can you just shout out what it, the translation is? It's, it's, it's the blockade is the greatest genocide, yes, in history. Now there are lots of, and it's interesting also that, that the United States and America, the, the, you know, there's no specific reference to the US, but the, the blo that, that's, that's what it says. The blockade is the greatest genocide in history. So what, so I took a picture and then later on, um, it made me stop and think Suppose the blockade, which what they call it the blockade, they don't, they, that's what they're named for, the, um, their, basically their fundamental relationship with America is the blockade. Suppose it were true that the blockade really was the greatest genocide. In other words, 
and, and, and I want you to try to think about this, not so much intellectually, but just sort of try to feel this for a moment. Just try to follow me for a moment. Suppose it really is. Suppose that the exclusion of Cuba from world trade by the United States and the impact that this has had on human beings, innocent human beings, has been completely devastating across sectors. We know that blockade has devastated every, every single sector. Okay, so that's one way to think about it. But here's another way to think about it. Suppose, the, suppose that the science and the development, the technologies, and the things that the Cuban government, the Cuban establishment have developed that have not been part of our medical establishment, suppose that they have also, for the United States, created similar kinds of harm. In other words, is it possible that by being excluded or by excluding ourselves from conversations with scientists from other countries, in this case for Cuba, for so long that we may have created harm to ourselves? I, I find that a really fascinating question because I think that this whole question, in my mind, of science journalism, how we want to define it, if there is such a separate thing. I think that that is the kind of thing it's concerned with. If there is something that's valuable about science journalism, I'm going to try to keep up at the time, to me it's that it is, it is, it is trying to ask questions about what science does and does not do, what science has access to and doesn't have access to, and why. I think that the idea of uh, science journalism, if we have an idea, is that we are trying to ask questions that are not, have not been asked, but questions that also have implications for larger populations, bigger populations than the people that we, that maybe bigger populations than ourselves. The, in terms of asking questions, I want to start with just a couple of examples. In terms of, again, this question of what kind of harm are we creating when we're not asking certain kinds of questions? And sometimes I don't think that harm or that injustice is measurable, but I think it's there. Uh, a couple of statements. This is from the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. This is, this is 2007. And the headline is, Gender Bias in Research, How Does It Affect Evidence-Based Medicine? Um, the evidence, the evidence basis of medicine may be fundamentally flawed because there is an ongoing failure of research tools to include sex differences in design and analysis. Uh, for example, this is the example they use. For example, research funding for coronary artery disease in men is far greater than for women, yet the same, yet the same at-risk population of women, which is an older group, suffers morbidity and mortality. The lack of funding for women's disease, in effect, maintains women's lower economic status. And then it goes on to talk about how this kind of research becomes even more complex because when you start to ask some scientists who are doing research in this area why they're excluding women, their answer is, well, we want to develop the research that we've already done in the past, which is also excluded women. So, so this is an interesting, we don't know what harm is happening here, but we also know that there's something that may be askew in terms of the research and the things that come out of that can affect all of us. Um, for example, women may have a different drug efficacy or side effect profile from men. Um, that's also been pointed out in the research. Here's another piece that I thought was very interesting, again, around biases and, and, and and again, thinking about what, what, what kind of reporting, what kind of thinking about science might, be, might, might intervene here. And I think it's something in, in many cases, these articles are an intervention. Uh, this is from, uh, gosh, this is from, I think, PLLS Medicine. Why are health studies so white? This is 2016, June 2016. Um, uh, and this article really talks about uh, talks about the lack of African American and people of color 
in trials for various medicines and various, various treatments. Uh, and one of the respondents is, is one of the respondents is saying that um, the reason that African Americans are not in these trials is because they they have a whole history going back to uh, the syphilis testing, you know, in the Tuskegee Project, that they don't trust medicine, they don't trust uh, researchers. But it turns out the research shows that that's really not true, that African Americans really are willing to participate in these trials. And so what you begin to get is the implication that actually researchers are just as biased as a lot of us. They want to, they want, they're in, they're, they're in the habit of bringing in people that they, are, that they know, and which in this case is largely white. And they don't do, as someone says, uh, actually the author comes out right here and says, I'm, we're not saying there's no such thing as distrust, but I think many investigators may not be taking the time to identify potential community partners for, for out, reaching out. Um, and you can go on. The other article I was going to refer to is, has, has to do with asthma and talks about the lack of African Americans and people of color in asthma research. And this, and this research they're talking about is from, from the NIH. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, from the NIH. So this, this goes on, there's another article, I mean, these articles go on, and what I'm sort of getting at is that, is that this is not just a, this is not a matter of simply a science problem. This is a, this is a matter of, it's a matter of justice. It's a matter of social justice. We're talking about communities who are being harmed or endangered, primarily because of the lack of uh, concern for communities of color or communities of women which are outside of the general mainstream within the science world, which tends to be largely white men. So I want, this is, I, to me, this is a good setup for the, the first clip that I want to show and, and talk about for a moment. Um, in about 2006, I was uh, invited to work on a series called um, Un Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. And I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's a seven-part series that was on the air for PBS. And what we were trying to look at was um, what was being described, and I think it's still being described, as the, the social determinants of health. And the concept, uh, the social determinants of health has been in the literature and has been discussed in the science for you know, probably over 100 years. And I think that term is actually the term that's been used. But this is one of those situations where it's something that has never been communicated in a way for the public. Uh, scientists don't talk to the public very well. I'm not a scientist, by the way, so I think that's one of my strengths in terms of this work. And you laugh, but I think that's good. I laugh too. I'm wondering why am I doing this? But I'm not a scientist. I don't have a science background. But as I was saying this afternoon to some of the, 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 the film students, I think my, I think accepting, I can make my ignorance work for me because if someone is trying to describe a complex process and I don't understand it, I can't communicate it. And I also can think about what it is that stops me from understanding it and, and work with that so that my audience can understand it. So the social determinants of health was a, was, a, was a tricky concept for me to understand because the fundamental idea is that, I mean, if you want to boil it down, I think, in a very short way, if you talk to most epidemiologists and you tell them what your zip code is, they can tell you what your risk for heart disease is, your, heart, your risk for diabetes is, your risk for all kinds of uh, problems are, and they can tell you how long you can expect to live. And the point is, that's unnatural. That should not be the case. But almost any epidemiologist in this country will tell you that it is the case. Um, and so we're trying to look at, in the, in the series, why that is. Uh, and so there's seven parts of this. It's actually a pretty complex series, very, I think, very, very well told. It's still being taught in many different um, um, public health schools. The clip I want to show is a short clip from a, a section uh, called um, When the Bow Breaks. And this is looking at um, um, pregnancies in African American women and the sort of, the sort of uh, challenges that they have uh, bringing a child it statistically bringing a child to term um, prematurely. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of this. this um, anyway, I should probably just show you the clip, but fun, but what interests me, interests me about what I want to show this clip is that, as I was saying this afternoon, the idea that race could, or racism, I shouldn't say race, racism could be a public health issue 
that you could have other kinds of ways of thinking about public health that might include race scientifically was just beginning to come on the scene. And I think now people are actually, researchers are actually publishing more and more material to sort of describe this. I think this, this clip comes in sort of as we're, as these researchers are beginning to talk about statistically, they're trying to understand why it is that African American women as a group, um, how do you begin to understand why there's this problem in terms of how they compare to other women in, in, in the United States? So this is a short clip. Let's take a look at this. Education, for example, uh, predicts infant mortality for both black women and white women. And the more educated you are, the less likely you are to have a low birth weight baby, a preterm baby, or an infant death. Women who are poorest and least educated are those whose babies are at greatest risk in any racial group. But the babies of African American mothers with higher education are still at greater risk than we'd expect. Infant mortality among white American women with a college degree or higher is about four deaths per thousand births. But among African American women with the same level of education, infant mortality is about 10 per thousand births, almost three times higher. In fact, African American mothers with a college degree have worse birth outcomes than white mothers without a high school education. Think about this. We're talking about African American doctors, lawyers, and business executives, and they still have a higher infant mortality rate than non-Hispanic white women who never went to high school in the first place. As a mother, you're thinking, I did all the right thing. They told me to take vitamins, I took vitamins. They told me to walk, they told me to eat vegetables, they told me not to drink, I didn't do all that. And why is my kid sitting there with these needles? And, you know, so you feel real helpless. You really feel helpless. So doctors Collins and David asked themselves if the answer could possibly be genetic. It's well known that prematurity can run in families. Is there something in the DNA of African-American women that tends toward premature births regardless of education, prenatal care, or lifestyle? To answer the question, they created a study based on a simple assumption. If there was such a thing as a prematurity gene and it came from Africa, then Africans should have more of it. They compared newborns among three groups, African-American women, African immigrants to the U.S., and U.S.-born white women. It turns out that the Africans and the whites were about the same. The African Americans, on the other hand, had babies that weighed almost eight or nine ounces less than the other two groups. In other words, African immigrants to the U.S. and white women born in the U.S. had similar pregnancy outcomes. So if there is any genetic predisposition for low birth weight babies, it's doubtful that it falls along what we call racial lines. It turns out that when African women immigrate to the U.S., it takes only one generation before their daughters are at risk of having premature babies at a significantly higher rate and with poorer birth outcomes. Has her heart rate been in that range, over 180? No, actually, it's been about 160. So within one generation, women of African descent are doing poorly. This, to us, really suggests that something is driving this that's related to the social milieu that African-American women live in throughout their entire life. Again, I think that there's an, one of the values of what we're calling science journalism is that it can begin to ask different kinds of questions that are not necessarily mainstream questions. I think that, you know, I think we depend on scientists and researchers and institutions to guard the quality of life that we have. We assume that that's going to happen, and I think when that doesn't happen mostly, it doesn't mean that people are, are, are insincere in their, in their vision and their efforts. But just because we're talking about trusted researchers and trusted institutions, it doesn't mean, in some cases, these, these institutions are, are supported by tax, our own tax dollars. It doesn't mean that they may be asking the right kinds of questions or that they're people with folks who are sensitive to asking those kinds of questions that we want to have asked. 
Um, and I'm reminded of Harvard uh, epidemiologist Nancy Krieger, who uh, actually opens this series. And she makes a very simple statement. She says, basically, <laughs> she says, basically, we're all going to die. We all get that. That's the price of the ticket being here. You know, but the question is, with what degree of preventable suffering? And that's really what we're talking about. And where science is not engaged properly in asking the right questions, then we're talking about very, very likely degrees of preventable suffering in populations that should not happen. So uh, I think it's quite interesting that now we're at a place where you have scientists having to reckon with research that makes it clear that racism, the impact of racial dynamics, racial race, so difficult interactions. What, what are, there's a there's a, I always I, I I blank on the word because of the term because I hate the term. Um, um, but these sort of daily interventions and these other kinds of things, um, as as uh, a number of psychotherapists, including my wife, like to say, and they, it's not it's a famous quote. And I can't think of the, the, the therapist who says this, but he says. The body keeps score. We think some of these events that happen in our head are just things we need to talk about. The body keeps score. The body absorbs these things. The body knows what you're struggling with. And so you begin to look and receive, understand you're talking about hypertension, you're talking about uh, 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 diseases of the heart, other kinds of effects, and these are measurable. And I think that that's going to be an interesting challenge as we go on for science to have, and, and medicine and public health to have to sort of reckon with the reality that what people have been saying about the trauma of living in this country day to day if you're a person of color may actually be something they have to you know, do much more with in their work. Um, the, the other thing I wanted, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is um, a film that I did with Nova not too long ago. Um, actually, that was a while ago. When was Percy Julian? 2000. Seven. Gosh, okay. In 2000, not too long ago, 2007, you know, dog years. Um, so, so, and this came out, this, and this film, I think, is another example, I think, of a kind of science journalism piece, which is really a profile that uh, was meant to talk about not just the achievements of an African American chemist, but to try to look at his life in science. In fact, that was a series, I think, it was called Life in Science. It was a, life, a, a series, a grant uh, for a life and science series that we did with NOVA. And we were trying to talk about not only Percy Julian's science, but also give a sense of what it, would mean, what it meant for him to be uh, a human being, an ordinary man, dealing with the things that he had to do with. Because I think sometimes we think about, I think that sometimes we don't have the full picture of what it means to be um, that scientists are like the rest of us. And that if you're a person of color, uh, you deal with those issues that everybody else has to deal with. Percy, many people, I, I didn't know, I have to say, who Percy Julian was when I started the project. And if, does anybody else know that name? So you're with me, so you didn't know either. I mean, Percy Julian was, was an African-American scientist who, uh, in his career, was, became quite um, well-known among other other scientists, other, other, other chemists, for the work he did at the Blinton Paint Factory, which sounds kind of like backwards. But even with a man of his understanding and um, his training, he had trained in Europe with some of the top um, chemists in the world, he was unable to get the work he wanted to get in terms of research. There was nobody uh, in, the, in the 30s and 40s who wanted to work with an African-American man. So he wound up being hired as a production chemist for Glidden Paint. And, and there he essentially wound up making Glidden Paint, creating a whole other, a separate industry within Glidden Paint, which was the synthesis of human steroids from slug products. He was the first person to uh, synthesize a progesterone from soy products and, and testosterone, a number of other feeds. But the, and basically his work in terms of establishing the, the showing how you could actually take um, elements from 
nature, synthesized them, and then scale up production, made many, many, many products uh, available to people. And in fact, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is, a, this is actually from um, Wikipedia. We know they tell the truth. Um, but basically, they're saying he's responsible for uh, making the availability of, 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 of birth control pills, corticosteroids, steroids, and all these things available to, to people. So we don't even know who this guy is. And one of the things that happened for me, actually, when I was shooting this, I remember that we were filming with, um, uh, with uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson, who plays Percy Julian in our reenactments in the film. Terrific actor who's done a lot of television work and he's on Broadway. And someone walked up and asked us in Baltimore what we were doing. Percy Julian was, he loved flowers. He, he built, I mean, actually he loved tulips specifically. So we actually were filming tulips. Uh, our actor was out there, you know, sort of, we were filming him uh, working in tulips. And this guy comes up and he says, you know, what are you doing? And we say, we're talking about, we're doing this film up. Percy Julian explained it. And he said, you don't have to tell me who this guy is. He, and it turned out this guy himself was a chemist. And he said, and he was retired, he said, I was a chemist, I was a pretty good chemist. And then he says, but I wasn't a chemist like Percy Julian. I mean, it was like this guy was very well known within the world of science. In fact, he comes to a science conference on um, synthesizing steroids. He had just done, he had just been the first person to synthesize progesterone in the country, I think in the world. So they're having a conference on synthesizing steroids. All the scientists are white, he can't get in. And basically, they threatened to shut down the whole conference so this guy gets in. So it's one of these people who is well known at certain levels within his own world of science after a point. But we still don't know who this, you know, despite the fact he has a stamp in his honor, we still don't know who this guy is. We also don't appreciate, I think, fully uh, not knowing him. We don't know what he went through, that he had seen a lynched man in his youth. He, he lived in a place where he could walk, he actually walked in the woods and saw a, a man who had been lynched that when he went to college, he had to stay basically in essentially a broom closet and just work for other people. I mean, he had sort of insult after insult after insult. Um, and they continued even after he became fairly well known and, and established at the Glidden, the, the Glidden Company. So this clip is really about um, his family coming to um, Chicago, coming to, the, I am blanking on the city. No, the park, where he lived, his house. Oh, park. <laughs> his family coming to Oak Park and buying a very large house and preparing to move in. And it's really the story of what happens when Percy Julian, well known now, uh, he's in advertisements for you know, cigarettes and this and that, moves into Oak Park and is ready to reestablish himself. So let's just roll that. The Julians moved in. And when a few months passed with no further trouble, Percy and Anna felt confident enough to go out of town, leaving the children with a babysitter. first my parents saw of it was when they saw it in the paper the next day with me pointing to the hole in the ground. Hey, but Daddy, um, I hear that there's, um... I'll never forget the, the morning that my daughter Sandra said, Daddy, they bombed my friend Percy Julian's house last night. And then she said, Daddy, why did they do that? Why would they bomb their house? I put on a record because I didn't have the answer. My dad was angry when he came home. I mean, really angry and clearly ready to fight. He looked at this as an attempt to murder his kids. For him, there was nothing redeemable about them at all. I'm taking this in like there's no tomorrow. And actually, you know, everything has a good side. The good side was, as a kid, I got to spend more time with my dad and got to stay up late because we'd sit in the tree outside 
he'd sit there with a shotgun. And we'd talk about why someone would want to do this and how wrong it was and how stupid it was. I was hoping that last that we'd stay longer. That's actually a letter that was written to him. There was a threatening letter. He continued to be threatened after uh, after he moved to Oak Park. And actually, that was the sec that was the second attempt to firebomb bomb his house. And um, and I like that clip because if you see uh, Forgotten Genius, the film, which is about 90 minutes long, there's a great deal about his science and about uh, the challenges he went through. And I think that. Uh, from the stories that I've heard from people who knew him, that this that this it, this impacted him so uh, deeply that he wound up being a, uh, being a political uh, working politically and openly for for affordable housing and fair housing and equal housing in Chicago. So I think that there's a I think when we're talking about science and we're talking about scientists and we're talking about sort of science journalism, I think there's a, it's a, a, there, there are other there are other kinds of questions that we can ask as for example, in this case, you know, what is the life of an African American? What was the life of an African American scientist like? Uh, trying to make his way in a world that, in many cases, uh, sometimes wanted him, sometimes didn't want him. Um, and the last, and the last part of this, I will say before I move on to the next, the next clip is, uh, I don't know if I told you this actually, uh, uh, what, Melanie, but at the end of. When we finished the Percy Julian film, you probably haven't you probably haven't seen it. If you don't know, you probably haven't seen the film, but you should watch it. It's a good film. At the end of the production, we actually what we do in the process is we show some of the people who worked on the film bits and clips so we can get a, get a feedback from them. And um, there was one gentleman who was a very important science advisor on the film, and uh, I remember that the last the last note of the film is really. I think a very important note. Again, one of those questions that doesn't get asked very often. We recount all of the things that he accomplished. I mean, they're extra he had an extraordinary life in science. There was, there was, we are still benefiting from the things he accomplished as a scientist, the things that had never been done before, but especially making um, all of these drugs that we know are helpful, figuring out ways to synthesize them and scale them up so that they could be available. That was probably one of his biggest accomplishments, and we're still thriving on that. But the last beat of the film, after all his accomplishments, is saying, but what if he'd actually had the opportunity that other scientists would have had to do the research that he wanted to do? This guy without, was out, without question a world-class thinker. And this particular gentleman was really upset with that ending. I mean, he really was upset that we wanted to end the film that way, because his feeling was, let's continue to celebrate his life and celebrate the you know, the accomplishments. And it's like, no, you actually have to hold them both. You actually have to hold them both. And I think that's something that we, in terms of thinking about science and even thinking about storytelling, we have a hard time doing. We want things to be very simple. Give me a nice ending, give me the ending I can follow. No, you need to. And in terms of science, it's important to think the same way. We have to hold both things. The desire that I think most uh, scientists, particularly in the public, health sector, and that's mainly what I'm talking about, is people who are connected with public health. The things that they want to accomplish versus, versus the things that they may be failing at and not know. The questions that they're not asking that we need to continue to ask that they're not prepared to ask or they, you know, for whatever reason. And I think that's, that's so I'm not, I'm not trying to offer any sort of random sort of con condemnation, but we do have a difficulty, I think, holding on to complexity. This gentleman certainly did. Um, so, this, so as I said, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I play one on, in the field I, um, when I'm in production, but um, I am a storyteller. I'm interested in, I am interested in stories. And as I was saying to students this afternoon, uh, I, 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 I try to be aware of what I'm not aware of, and I try to use that to help me think about how do I communicate these things to people who may not be aware of these things. What is it about a presentation on science or, or an investigation that excites me and I'm going to assume that I may excite other people? What's the hook that gets me? I'm thinking that's going to get, get other people hooked on, on the thought of the idea. Um, when I was asked to do the film about uh, the Flint water crisis, um, I think that one of the most uh, striking things about that episode was the sense that 
the people who were the scientists that I was mentioning before, who we were depending on, or people would depend on for their safety and for the safety of their water and the safety of their children, had failed them so horrifically that some of them are actually being charged right now with uh, manslaughter. With um, I, I, it's not manslaughter. What is manslaughter? I can't tell. It's, it's um, what is the term? It is a involuntary manslaughter. I'm sorry. I want to write that down. That's pretty extreme for a public health official. Um, so when we went into this film, I, our, I think our job was, though the, the water crisis had already begun to play out completely, I think our job was to find a way to talk about it in terms of not just the science of what happened, but also the failure of the scientists who were tasked with looking after and taking care of the water situation in France. Um, and as we got more and more into the story, it became clear that you really couldn't talk about one without the other. And I think that was one of the things that made it an unusual film for the Nova series because it has, it's difficult to talk about the science of the water crisis without getting into the politics as well. So I want to show this short clip and then I'm going to stop for questions. But this short clip is from um, uh, Poison Water. And uh, at this point in the story, uh, the, 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 the independent investigators who come in to show that there's a water problem in Flint and to explain why there's a water problem in Flint um, have been, um, I would use the, person, the term, smacked down again by the establishment. There's a complete continual denial of, of any real independent research that's being done. And so this sort of becomes the, 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 the last straw that begins to crack open um, the awareness of where people begin to finally see this is, there's no denying this anymore. It can't, not, it can't be hidden. So maybe we can play this clip, please. That night was the first night that I stopped sleeping. Because anybody who knows anything about lead stops sleeping. And that really kind of started my almost crusade to find out if that lead in the water was getting into the bodies of our children. This is not something you mess around with. We are never, ever, ever supposed to expose a child to lead because once a child has it in their blood, there is not much that you can do about it. Dr. Hannah Atisha begins a systematic study of the amounts of lead in children's blood. How old are you? What we did is we compared lead levels before the water switched in 2013, and we compared them to lead levels after the water switch in 2015. We were really only looking at one thing, was the percentage of children with lead levels at or above five micrograms per deciliter. When we saw the results, we weren't surprised, but we were heartbroken. How could this have happened? We saw that the percentage of children with elevated lead levels, this, this five or greater, had doubled after the water switch. And in some neighborhoods where, where the water lead levels done by Mark Edwards were the highest, were the same neighborhoods that the children's blood lead levels had increased the most. But right away, the state's machinery began to dismiss me. They began to dismiss the research and that the state's numbers didn't add up to my numbers. They said it was causing near hysteria. I shouldn't have been surprised because for 18 months, the people of Flint were dismissed and the moms were dismissed and the activists were dismissed and the pastors and the journalists and the EPA scientists were dismissed. I think, I think that the um... The only thing I would add to that is I think that what's, what's curious about the Flint, there are two things. One is that, you know, we some, I was talking with someone just a moment ago about what was happening in Flint, and that's that the problem I think largely now is fairly psychological. After that kind of trauma in a community, you know, it's like, it, it, I don't even know, again, how do you even measure the, level, the, the consequences of, 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 of mistrust? Uh, I've talked to people there, when scientists had actually said that the water was safe to drink, who said they would never drink this water? 
who will continue to use bottled water, uh, which actually is a health problem. Uh, most people don't realize that that's actually, there are lots of problems with just only using bottled water. But, um, and the other thought is actually, uh, and I was talking, I've been talking about this today, you actually, uh, Melanie actually sent me an uh, email about what was going on in Newark. In Newark, yeah, yeah. The same, almost the same exact thing. I mean, the exact thing. Problems with the pipe infrastructure, people who are responsible for the water lying about the amount of lead in the water and lying and lying until somebody comes in with an independent research uh, investigation to show actually no, the people are, being, are really at risk. And as we said at the end of, of, of this film, this is going to be repeated again and again and again in the United States because our water infrastructure is so decrepit because it hasn't been cared for and the cost to do that is so immense. Um, so I mean, so I think that's again a part of, you know, a part of, uh, I don't know, the work of, of, of thinking about science and, and, and justice is uh, going back to this thought which sticks with me, which is, you know, we, we all die, but at what level of unnecessary risk and unnecessary harm, unnecessary risk. Um, and whatever we can do to challenge the things that create more harm or, or suffering than we, than we should have, those are the things that, that this kind of work, thinking about science, should be, should be trying to pursue. Um, so I would like to stop there. And, and um, I'm much more interested in, 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 in questions if there are questions. Oh. That's very kind. Thank you. I have one. Sure, please. I'm getting started on the project. I'm sorry. What gets you started on the project? What ignites your interest for I, I, I um I think it's a story. I mean, I don't know how to say it any better. I think that when, you know, when I mean in the in the, the, the several films that I've done with Nova, they've always been. Uh, a powerful story that ties science with storytelling. I mean, I've said, as I said at, at, at lunch today, I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, and it's not that I'm not interested in science, um, but there are certain kinds of science stories that I can't, I don't engage me as a producer. I mean, you know, if you want to talk about the T-Rex and how big they were and blah, blah, blah I'll watch that, but I'm not, I, that's not my thing. It's, it, it, the only stories that, I, that get my attention are sort of, there are real consequences that expand even beyond the characters, and the implications are implications for all of us to be concerned about. Those are, the, I mean, which are, again, that's another way I think of thinking about social justice stories, but those are the stories that I'm interested in telling. Science, the science is important, and the science is uh, even central, but it's also a vehicle for other kinds of questions that we need to ask. So those are the stories that always attract me. Um, my background is history, so if there are dimensions of American history, then that gets me even jazz, more jazz. Uh, I happen to think history is badly taught and badly understood in this country, but that's a whole separate other, other conversation. Anybody else? Well, I can, thank you enough. Oh, no, wait, but wait, there's more. To Flint High School College? You were living there? Okay, oh, you went there two years ago? Okay. 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 How did I, I can I can ask you a question before I answer my question? How did it affect you to be there?
It's 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 very. Um, it is not abstract to be in those places and talk to people like that. I I um, in this film that's interesting. There's a there's a. I mean, I'll I'll talk about myself and I'll talk about the film. This, this particular note on something that's actually not in the film. The it, it, it it's. I think that the more you talk to people, I think the more affecting. Uh, and disturbing it is, and um, and I think, as I said, the thing that sort of struck me and left me sort of, uh, and, and and when I was in Flint, I kept talking is, is the level of trauma. I mean, it's, there's only one word for it. It's trauma, um, and there's a kind of hurt that you know, which was I couldn't, which I was hard for me to stay with because it's sort of like a hurt that you can't find a way to heal because it's just, it's, there's a level of hurt that we just can't, there's no way to, in my impression, there's no way of fixing it. And it was just, I found it hard, I found it hard, I had to sort of step back a number of times. There was, um, there's a, a sequence in the film where we talk about the students, Mark Edwards, who is a uh, Virginia Tech, um, uh, brings a number of students into uh, Flint to do the work of the do actual research and, and, and with the people there to, to do independent work to, to show that the water actually is dangerous to drink. Um, and I met a number of those students and it was really interesting to talk about them and they were very enthusiastic about what they did but a number of them said that it was so traumatic they couldn't go back. So it's not easy sometimes, you know, in terms of being in that space and really, if you spend time with people, let you let them. I mean, it's it, it, it's you can't it's you can't not be there, and not feel something. You can't just sort of take pictures. It doesn't work that way. I can't. Hear you. Don't be sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very interesting point. By the time we got there, there were so many cameras, and and people were sort of sick of cameras. I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, you're trying to figure as as as, as one of our one of, as um, a Leanne Walter says at the end of the film. She says, "If you think this is hard, if you think this is not. I'm sorry. If you think this is not so hard, turn off your water for a week and see what happens to you in your life. Just turn it off for a week. And and." People are reporting, I mean, there are people from other countries who are reporting. I mean, so by the time, we, there are cases where we would come in to do an interview, and there's a camera person set up on the corner, or I, I literally in one case, we came to do somebody's interview, and the camera, the, the camera crew is just leaving. I mean, it's just like they're, they're, they're sort of sick of it. But I have to say that I think that one of the things we had in our favor is that they knew we were going to keep coming back, and we kept coming back, and we were trying to do something bigger. I'm not saying that all the reporting was very simple. I am not saying that, but that was why we were there to do a larger picture. And I think that it's not that we we discovered anything new. I don't think we discovered anything new, but I don't think anybody had put together a whole picture of just sort of what actually happened and what, where, and where did the failures, where did the institutions that were supposed to be responsible for these things break down, and what did they do? And I think that trying to tell that complete story, and, and there are lots of things left out. There's one more piece I want to add. I'm glad you said to ask that question. Trying to tell that story, I think, and, uh, and trying to make that story available to people, I think, and knowing that we were trying to do that, I think, was, gave us a, a certain a bit of uh, credibility that I think some people didn't have. And so we, they were pretty welcoming. I think the thing we left out of the film, and, and it's left out of that story, and there's no way we could have gotten in, is that and most people don't realize this, but it's very, very important. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring it into the film. And that is that the, if you look at the research, if you look at the historians, there are, a couple, there are two really good books out about Flint now. And if you look at the, um, the civil rights, uh, the, the Michigan civil rights, uh, that's their, uh, their report uh, on Flint, they all say, they say numbers, but the one thing they, they, they say, uh, all said the same thing in this one case, which is that the water crisis is really, the, it, it's, 
To understand really what that meant, you have to go all the way back in history to um, when the economic situation in Flint broke down. And what they basically say is that the water crisis is a result of, of neglect, institutional harm, institutional racism, and all kinds of things that undermined uh, Flint for decades and allowed the state to come in and do the kind of things they do. Because by the time that the water crisis come, really comes in, the state is basically dismantling Flint's economy, literally. They have brought in, they have brought in um, state managers, and their job is basically to find the resources to pay off the debt, and they really don't give a damn where they come from. So, the, so what they were planning to do was basically separate, set up a separate water, uh, a separate water source for Flint, uh, basically to make money to pay off Predators. I mean, the idea of setting up the source makes sense, the things they're trying to do, but I'm just saying that's one part of this sort of story. In other words, they, the people in Flint had been struggling with a lot of this stuff up to this point, and, and these writers will say, essentially, that the water crisis is just the, is the ultimate outcome, where you basically have managers coming in who are not really concerned with the public well-being, not really that knowledgeable in some cases about the water infrastructure, making decisions which are essentially about paying off debt. And so um, that's a story we couldn't get into. But um, there, as I said, I wish I could think of the two books, but there's one that's really, really very good that sort of takes this into this perspective. And you can begin to realize, or you can, you will begin to realize that there are a lot of other cities who are facing similar, similar crises, or going to be, or are in sort of similar crises, you know, where you've got economics that undermining people's lives, and that makes people politically and economically help, helpless, and then, you know, here come the people to take it apart. So, yeah. Yeah, well, well one of the, 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 this issue came up. That was one, first of all, we had a pretty good response from people in Flint. And there are two things that came up in the question and answer session, because um, I was there, uh, Paul was there, there were a number of people there who were in the film. The first thing was that um, a lot of people felt wanted, wanted to make it understood that the water crisis for them was not over. That even, uh, even when um, scientists were saying that the water is drinkable and usable with a filter, that they were saying no, that they were still having problems, that they did not believe that. And, um, so that was one thing, and, and, and that gets into a whole uh, that gets into a whole area which I, 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 I that I sort of struggle with because uh, is that mean, does that mean the water is safe? What, what does it actually mean? Is that you know is that um, a physical response? Is it a traumatic response? Is there something still going with the water? Some people have these problems. Some people don't. What you know? What is that? You know, but clearly there's, there, there are people who are still struggling with the water even though people are saying it's safe. What does that mean? I don't know. Um, I'm not denying their struggle. I still know what that means. And people are making it clear, no, this is not done. We are, this is not safe. We don't trust this. And clearly there's also a lot of mistrust of, of the institutions there. The second thing that came up that I remembered is the thing I just brought up which is people saying that you, you, you've got to understand, or one person in particular said, you've got to understand that there's a history that takes us to this point. And if you don't understand the history, you really don't quite, you don't understand the politics that, that created this moment where you know, now we're looking at a, a completely destroyed water structure um, done by people who essentially had come here to take the city apart to pay off debt. Um, I'm happy to take other questions on that unhappy note. <laughs> but other questions? I love your cues. <laughs> you, um, I don't, actually, she's not in this clip, I'm sorry. I don't, um, Leanne Walters is. Uh, Gosh, I should have a Leanne Walters clip, but Leanne Walters is sort of this amazing um, woman who, her son was uh, lead poisoned by the water in Flint, and um, 
She is the person and other scientists who come to Flint, especially Mark Edwards, make the point, um, and I love the way he makes the point, he says, basically, we didn't discover the problem of what was happening in Flint. Um, we, it was Liang Walters who figured out what the problem was. We came in with the science to, 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 uh, to, to um, just underscore the reality of what she found. Basically, the short story is that Leanne Walters is living in Flint, and her kids are having rashes and all kinds of problems, and she's trying to get help from people who are trying to, who are basically denying her support, saying this is not happening, it's not our issue, she can't get any support. And she eventually reaches out to someone at the EPA who, um, not if, well, actually, um, anyway, she reaches out to someone who's able to test the water. Turns out there's a huge amount of lead in the water, and she's trying to figure out what's going on. And she does the research to figure out that the city does not have a water, does not have corrosion control in place. And the way that corrosion control works, and this is probably the most important science we do really in the film, um, when you when you have a population of 100,000 people, you have to have a corrosion control plan, especially if you're changing water sources, and that's what they were doing. They were moving water. They were, change, moving, they were going to build a new source for the water um, from Huron, but to do that, they actually had to move the water, the water source to, to the Flint River first, which was very polluted. The problem wasn't that the Flint River was polluted. They had no corrosion control plan. And what that means is you have a plan so that the interior of the pipes is kept safe. Because as water flows through the pipes, it develops a kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, but sort of interior sort of uh, protection. Because, it, because it's, it's, if you run water directly through pipes, it has no, um, no um, I don't know what you call this. There's a chemical uh, name, but it's a sort of a film, actually. That, yeah, a film is a good word, film that develops in the pipes. If you're running water directly through the pipes, it's going to pull into the water, whatever that is, if it's copper, if it's whatever. So you've got to have a plan to protect that film. That's corrosion control. Well, these guys had no plan. So what basically happened is when they went to the Flint River, that water went straight into the pipes. It ripped off that, that uh, protection. And um, then lead and other things began to come into the water. Well, Leanne Walters was the, was the person who kept investigating, kept asking for documents, and finally found the document that showed that they had no water, no corrosion control. And, um, and you, in the film, you'll see there's several people who say, when they saw that document, they were just like, they flipped out. You know, people who understood what that meant, just like, they lost their mind. Because like, you just, you don't do that in a city. Um, that's essentially, and I don't know how they got there, but that's, a, that's essentially the same problem in, 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 in yeah, Newark. Yeah, there's no, yeah. So that, so the, so the people, so the, whoever it is, the mayor is trying to make the, he's saying there's nothing wrong with the water, and now they say, now the scientists come in and say, no, yes, there is. And they say, oh, but I didn't say the, you said the water, I didn't, you didn't mention the pipes. I mean, it's like, it's just this crazy, it's like, are you insane? So, but, but Leanne Walters was the person who figured this out. And when she connected with other scientists like Mark Edwards, they were the ones who came in who said, well, this, this sounds insane, and we've tested your water, your water's off the charts for lead, so let's go in and do another piece of research. And as Leanne Walters talks about in the film, it was, it was a remarkable piece of research because it required that the community do the measuring. And the measuring to test water is very complicated. You have to do certain jugs at certain times, certain amounts, at certain hours. It's all got to be labeled. It's going to get sent out. And so they had 250 people basically helping, no, 200 people helping them do this. And so it's, it's an example of really you know, ordinary people getting into the science of protecting themselves. And the result of that work really showed without, you know, without question that there was a hazard in the water, and of course, the state responds and said, that's nonsense, you didn't do the research. So, and this goes on and on and on until this moment when um, uh, Hannah, uh, Dr. Anatisha does this lead study, and it becomes clear that the children are being, uh, being um, injured by this, or children are potentially being injured by the water. And that's when, and that's when things really flip drastically the other way, when the, the state has to finally back up and acknowledge that there's a, there's a problem. Um, and those lawsuits are still going on. Yeah. 
Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. I never heard that from you. <laughs> but I think that's. I think that in terms of science, science, um, the kind of science storytelling I like. That's that's the challenge. I mean, it's not. It's it's showing. It's doing both. Yeah, keeping the science line going, and. But making, but also making it clear that it's almost like you can't tell. If you can come up with a structure where you it, you feel like you can't talk about one without the other, then you're really there. You know, you're there. You can't talk about the science without the people. You can't talk about the people without the science. Then you're, you know, that's that's when you nail it. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah. Okay, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Thank you very much for coming, all of you who did. Thank you. You love where? What?